Okay, so we have seen how XY pads have been declared. Now let's add some functionality to them. This is part two to XY pads in contact for your instrument. Hey, my name is Steve, composer, engineer, and lecturer, and welcome back to the channel and part two of our XY pad controls. XY pads, as we mentioned in the last video, are really unique for performance controls. They're kind of like two sliders that can be controlled at once. And you can find unique combinations between these two effects that are being controlled on this XY pad that you may ne necessarily have got had you been using only sliders or knobs. This is something I relied on for my Ambido library that I posted to pianobook.co.uk. You can check that one out yourself and download it for free. It's a cinematic string synth library that uses an XY pad control. Controller. In the last video, we saw how I declared the XY pad and what some of the scripted lines are in order to make that work. And now we're going to dive into how to actually tie some functionality to those XY controls. So let's dive in and check it out. Now, as I did with the last video, I'm using Brackets, a coding software here, just to be able to show you the script. In the actual library itself, when I go into the spanner and I jump into the script editor, you can see the performance view here. And as I scroll down, here's all the code inside. And I would normally script all my stuff in here, or I'd use a more complicated software program to do it called Sublime that allows me to sort of sync between it. Brackets is just me here showing you the script because it's a little easier to see than this small script down here. So I thought it might be nice to be able to blow it up a little bit. Don't feel like you have to have brackets. That's not what this video is about. It's just me showing you the script in a little bit of a larger format. Now, this is where we left off with the XY pad declaration before. So I was declaring my XY pad and assigning the uh, background and the cursor image. I set the, up the automation. I set up the mouse behavior and the position of the XY pad and the starting point, making it all persistent when we close and reopen the library later. As I scroll down, I've annotated all of my coding so that it's much easier to follow along later on. That allows you to download any one of my libraries and see how I've made it as well. So by all means, go to Piano Book, search my name. You can download any of those libraries and open up the script editor and see how I've coded something. I more than encourage you to do that. As we scroll down, I'm going out of the on init control block or the callback there into the UI control callback block. This is where we actually tie functions to the XY pad or any other control so that when we move a control on our UI screen, it's actually going to do something to a parameter or an effect or something. So as I scroll down, I've got all these different controls that are on my screen and sliders and switches and all sorts of things. But as I come down here, I come to the XY pad. Now, the coding that I've got in here is a little bit more intense than you probably need for an XY pad. So I'm gonna show you just a couple of lines on how to make this work and then explain why I've got so much text here. Spoiler alert, it's to do with all those switches that are on the front of the library. Okay, so under my XY section, I've got my on UI control callback. And here's my end on for that. So I always with a callback have a start with an on and then an end with an end on. So I need to make sure that all of my code for my XY pad functionality is in this callback. I pop up here the on UI control, I specify which control it is, and I'm using my variable name there. The uh, question mark XY is what I called my XY pad. Now in here is where I'm using the same control that we've always used before. As I mentioned in the last video, I'm assuming that you know some basic scripting knowledge with contact specifically, or you may have seen my free contact tutorial series. By all means, check that out, link above or in the description below. But the set engine par does come up quite a lot. We use that to change a parameter when we're using an on UI control. So set engine par, I'm changing the engine par volume and I'm changing it to a specific amount. I'm gonna explain this section in a minute. And then it's set to say, in this case, group three outside, not at an instrument level, not as a send effect. Honestly, check out my scripting tutorial series if you wanna know more about how the set engine par control works. Uh, because that I'm going to skim over that now and assume that you know how those variables usually work. If you know how they work, you will notice that there is one thing that is different in here, and that's this section here. Normally what goes in here is the effect 
name or the control name. If we think of a knob or a slider, for example, as we move that knob on screen or that slider on screen, it's changing to a value between zero and a million possibly. But it's going to return an integer number. So normally with other parameters that all work on integer values of between zero and one million, that would be fine. We would just throw in the variable name and that would tell contact what to move it by. You can actually see that happening at the top here. So as I scroll up, you can see a set engine par here. It's saying engine par attack and it's saying look at the actual attack controller in its position and put that in as the value. So it's a very common way of coding and it's basically saying when I move the UI it's going to return a value, make that value the value of the attack or the volume or whatever it is you're controlling. Down here though I've got this function embedded in there instead. That's because of what I mentioned last video which is XY pads, they are not integer variables. They are actually real number variables or real variables. It's specifying that it uses real numbers. It uses a number that could include point something. It's no longer just a one, a two, and no number in between. It could be 1.5. In this case, actually, the XY pad is anything from the number zero to the number one. So 0 0.62579 that could be a number that it spits out. Because of that, we've got a bit of a problem here. The set engine par is sort of expecting an integer value of somewhere between zero and a million, but it's returning a value of no higher than one, and it could be a decimal point, which is something it's not gonna know what to do with. So we have to use a function to convert that number into a real number and use a little bit of maths here as well. So basically, instead of saying the xy pad, just return whatever value it's saying, we have to specify that it needs to return that value and change it into a integer value. So that's why we're using the real to int or integer. Real to integer is just changing the number from a real number to an integer value. So if we get a number, I don't know, 227.5, it might go 228 instead. Or it might just simply drop and go to 227, just drop that percentage afterwards. I'm not sure whether it rounds up or not. I think it just drops the percentage but I'm not entirely sure. Either way, it converts it so that it doesn't have that percentage or that point afterwards. It's only an integer value. The other thing to note is that we've got the x, y, and these square brackets here. The square brackets are saying one. And that's basically saying attack the y parameter. We, we're talking about the y parameter, not the x. x would be zero, y is one on this first cursor. So make sure you set that to one or zero to tell it whether it's going to be the x value or the y value that you're looking at. So in this case, it's saying real to integer, change the real number into an integer value by looking at the xy pad y value and timesing it by 600,000. Now, the reason I'm timesing it by 600,000 is that the real number that's getting converted is gonna be between zero and one. So either it's gonna pick zero or one, and that's it. There's only two values, on or off. The knob though, for, for the volume, is actually going to move by anywhere up to a million. In this case, I'm restricting it to 600,000. That's just because the volume knob can go above zero decibels to plus 12 decibels. And I, I don't want any of that range. I just want everything up to zero decibels. So in this case, I'm saying the XY pad, the Y value of it needs to be times by 600,000. For instance, if you then get a value of 0 0.5, which means that the cursor is halfway along the Y value, then that's gonna return 300,000. And that's gonna set the knob of the volume to halfway to its maximum. Perfect, that's exactly what we need. So again, to recap, this function is basically saying, take the XY pad, look at the y controller that will return a number between zero and one that could be a point number so it could be 0 0.5 or 0 0.67 or whatever times that by 600,000 you'll notice the point zero very important there because it's talking about a real number so make sure you put the point zero in there that's going to return a specific number and then the real to integer function is going to change whatever that number is into an integer which might mean dropping this 0 0.0 or 0 0.2 or whatever might be left there. That way, it's a long-winded way of saying it's going to take the number that Y returns and make it useful to the volume control. <sighs> okay, hopefully you're still with me. It's a little bit to get your head around. Essentially, it means that you're doing a little bit of extra steps there because you're dealing with this mixture of real and integer values. But if you download Ambido, check out the code and see how I've laid it out. It's, it's kind of straightforward after you get why you're doing it because of that integer and that real number conundrum. Now,
Inside the on UI control for this XY pad, one line is plenty for the Y value and one line is plenty for the X value. So I might have these two lines here and one would be XY0 and one would be XY1 and they're controlling different engine par volumes on different groups maybe. Whatever it might be, that could be per perfectly fine and simple for your XY pad. The reason there's more code here is because of what I decided to do with those switches on the side. Basically, I want it to go if reverb switch is on X or Y, do something. If chorus switch is on X or Y, do something. If I flick over to Ambito for the moment, basically the code solution that I have is the one zero is basically on or off for each of these effects. And that basically just means low pass filter will be turned on or it'll be bypassed. So this has actually got nothing to do with the X, Y pad really. All it does is turn the effect on or off. This section though is where the magic happens so I can assign it to the X or the Y value. If these are set to X, I will have the code do one thing on the X axis. If it's set to Y, it'll do it instead on the Y axis. And that's where these if functions come into play. Let's take a look at the low pass filter, for instance, at the bottom here. I have an if function. That is saying if low pass switch x, y is set to zero, so if this low pass filter switch here is set to x, then set engine par cutoff to the zero axis or the x axis. So whatever I move the X by, it's going to change it on the cutoff. The set engine par down here is because of the else. So it's saying if it's set to X, do one thing. Else, if it's not set to X, which means it will be set to Y, do something a little bit different. And all I've done is exactly the same function, but this time it's using the Y value, not the X value. So that's what I loved about this library. When I came up with this idea, I was like, awesome. I can basically say any of those controls could be anywhere on X or the Y value. Really, really useful. It does basically mean that inside the on UI underscore control, we have a number of if functions. So basically it says when you're using the on UI control, when the control is being used and moved, it will then run a series of if questions and go, if this switch is set to X or if it's set to Y, do one of these things. It's quite a simple method when you think about it, but I, 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 when I thought about it, I was like, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm gonna love this. This is gonna be awesome. But there you have it. That is how to assign some functionality to an XY pad. It's very much the same as setting a UI control for any other control, but that real to integer value is really where it's different, where it changes. And specifying as well, whether it's the X or the Y that you're going for with that zero or one in those square brackets. Those are the things to remember with this. So I do hope that you've enjoyed these two videos and that you've got something out of it. Hopefully you can now throw in an X and Y pad control into your next instrument. I must admit, if you're anything like me when you first try this, you will probably come back to this video a couple of times and just have to double check some things. It's very kind of interesting to work out. It's, it's a little bit of a headache and you know, that's coding in general, to be honest. It's a problem solving process, but persevere, it will be worth it. I have some more videos coming for contact and I will always be releasing more libraries and there'll be more to talk about in each one. I also have plenty more free tutorial series on the way, not just for contact, but for lots of other different topics within music production. So why not subscribe? It's now is the best time. Honestly, some more people have been joining every day and I am loving the fact that I can help you guys out. So subscribe on your way out, but otherwise I will catch you in the next video. See you later.